welcome everybody that's here. Um, my name is Vincent Batts. I go by VBATS most places, GitHub or otherwise. Um, I've worked in open source for quite a while. Um, and it's interesting, like the fine golden thread that will lead you to whatever projects you hope to work on if you're new or interested in open source. Uh, it's, it's a very common and kind of interesting problem to be like, what problems, what problems or teams do I want to work on or like finding your project that you would like to work on and contribute? Um, I remember asking some of the same things and finding that just having fun kind of led a path. So it was, I started having fun with systems in general and then I started enjoying and seeing the power of like Ruby and other things like that and then what could I do with Ruby? Uh, I left it off here, but that even led me into contributing to KDE with some of the first projects, which led me into Slackware Linux and being a contributor there. Um, at some point, I started having a job that paid me to work on some of those projects, and I got involved in Golang uh, pretty early, uh, more on the consuming end of it. And that led into Docker and containers, which has been the last uh, 10, 10 years or so. Um, so I'm currently at Azure um, by way of joining Kinfolk, and um, lots with containers and Linux and otherwise. So first off, kind of the, 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 the current situation here, and, and if I'd love to hear people's uh, input on maybe what you hope for or look for in the nature of this talk, like pushing things to container registries that aren't necessarily containers. But the current situation is that we have cloud native. And so if you're deploying or even reading other people's YAML, if you're touching anything with Kubernetes, um, or you're just working with container runtimes directly, Docker, ContainerD, um, whatever it is, in the Kubernetes space, so much YAML, you see lines like this one. And um, obviously with mountains of YAML, everything means something, hopefully. Uh, otherwise, why is it there? But it's interesting that what such a small little line like this one could uh, have typos and stable, um, but have a lot of implications of what's happening behind that one line. So here now you have an image, um, and you're like, well, it's 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 super easy. What's what's going on behind that image? Uh, and so what's actually hidden behind that is. Uh, potentially dereferencing that tag, and some of this is probably stuff you might already know, and if, you, if you're not familiar with some of those mechanics, we'll dive a lot deeper into it. But right now, if you pulled that Nginx stable, it dereferences, and ideally, so that you have more of a deterministic deployment, it's actually going to a very specific image, a very specific pointer to that image right now. So if you wanted to deploy the same thing in a couple of different locations, you should actually be pointing at the exact uh, image digest. Also in that, you know, reference is gonna be the API for how to pull that image down. Um, people hear about Docker Hub, it's usually even implied if you say Docker run Nginx, it's already implied that it's coming from Docker IO. Um, but there's a whole registry API behind that. You might be using, you know, Quay, you might be using GCR, you might be using Azure's ACR. Um, there's, there's a whole API defined for that. Um, the actual packaged image, like what is it actually doing? Um, how many of you here have ever put your hands on a tar archive? You have facetious, okay, it's super exciting. It's, it's technology from like 40 years ago. It was literally meant to put on the tapes uh, and it's still at the crux of everything that's being pushed around the internet. We've tried to remove it, I promise you. We've tried to remove it and think about better things. Sometimes it, it happens, sometimes it sticks and then we find ourselves using it again. Um, but it's surprisingly at the center of uh, kind of the hot spot. I mean, it's built into the Kubernetes cluster. You, you, if you're just doing a one-off deployment, as soon as you're moving to some cloud, you're, one of the first things you're trying to figure out is, you know, what's the container registry? How do I trust who's pushing there? How do we audit? How do we fetch? You know, and then you start down all the different processes. So it's kind of at the crux of this whole cloud native movement. A bit of background on it. Um, 
the container ecosystem as we know it was very fast moving. Um, and there was a lot of things involved in the early days that rightfully kind of wanted to keep a tight grip on how things were evolving, um, specifically in the Docker company. And there was lots, you know, right, rightfully, there were a lot of companies and other just contributors that wanted to be involved. And figuring out how to have an open governance conversation around that, it took time. Um, and so that part took time while the containers and the APIs and the format were quickly evolving. Um, went through several different pretty drastic iterations. Um, if anybody had you know, touched containers in the early days, does anybody remember the days before the checksum actually being a real checksum? Anybody? No. In the early days, when you would actually Docker build something, it just DD'd a little bit off of dev you random and checksummed that. And that was the ID of the image. Completely not you know, checksummed, content addressable at all. So like big iterations uh, over time to where you could actually trust and have predictability about it. Um, so the open governance, and so as we moved into open governance, some of those formats started going into a project that is called o Open Containers Initiative. It's an LF project, um, has a governance board, or you know, t TOB maintainers and otherwise. At first it was just specs. Um, and then it kind of teased out into being like, first we're gonna talk about the runtime, like run C, the thing underneath container D and Docker, you know, the low level of execution. And then it became for image format and we got various things packed into image format. And the last thing to get defined in this open governance was the API. So for a long time that was still held by Docker and basically people had implied standards like de facto, but it was not really an open governance conversation. So if you ever find yourself reading or trying to make sense of that order, understand that some things might be in the image spec that now should probably be in distribution spec, but it's just the evolution of it. And uh, there's a lot of overlap between the maintainers and the conversations. Um, some of them are here this weekend. Um, and particularly, I'll, I'll touch on this, the OCI media type. Um, as we got into this open governance conversations, the de facto standards of being like Docker run, you know, Docker images and otherwise, um, were basically a drop in translation to these new open governance formats and media types or MIME types. Um, and so as we ironed out some of the changes that were gonna happen there, um, still today, I mean, this is the, the first V1 of this open governance OCI format was in 2017, and still today you'll find kind of a hodgepodge of media types, MIME types, whether they're still Docker, Docker manifest lists and stuff like that, or if they're OCI image index. And they're pretty interchangeable, um, but I, I'm just to emphasize, you know, Docker came out in 2013, Kubernetes came out in 2014. Some of these changes in you know, like open governance format happened in 2017 to have a V1 of like, cool, we all agree on some of these standards. And here we are six years later and it's still a hodgepodge of some of those media types. It wasn't like a, a quick switch. Most of the time that's not a problem. It just kind of shows you that things move fast and then some things move painfully slow as people either depend on them or otherwise. Um, so <laughs> container images are uh, basically Merkle trees. Um, has anybody played with Merkle trees before? Have people heard of Merkle trees before? A little bit shaking. Yeah, I know this, is, this might be something of a beginner track, but uh, it's, it's kind of fun to at least see and hear about some of these concepts. Generally speaking, in a Merkle tree, you'll see here the L1, L2, L3, L4. Those are the chunks of different data involved. And you see the arrows pointing up because it's actually kind of cascading in the way that these chunks together will actually contribute to a, you'll make a checksum of them. It'll go up to the next node, next node, and eventually you'll have a single digest at the top that is comprised of all those different 
components. So you could, you could take and say, actually, I'm only interested in L1. Well, you could have the hash of that and figure it out in the content addressable store. But if you say, all right, I've already got that one chunk, and I just need to know like, what's the top so that we're like, looking at the same thing, it bubbles up. If anything in any of those L1, L2, L3, L4 change, the top checksum changes. Fundamentally a different object. And it's not Angela Merkel, I just think it's funny. Um, and so in a container, these are fundamentally some of the different components. I know this is hard to read, but you have the image index, which is usually when you say Nginx latest, it's going to point, point to some image index. That thing might have different architectures, ARM, whatever, uh, AMD64, a whole subset, subset of them. They will be referencing one or more image manifests. Those image manifests will be where it says, like, here's this config for how it's going to launch, you know, entry point, environment variables, all that kind of stuff, and a list of tar layers that we're going to assemble into a file system. That's all the stuff that's happening behind the scenes. So you see it's going to have a one-to-one -one of some kind of a config and a one or more set of layers. Um, the part that's just a pile of text here is a number of the different MIME type media types that are interchangeable at this point. Um, so each one of those objects in the stack and the order that they're in is all part of the Merkle tree. So when you see you know, de that dereferenced digest at the beginning is actually the checksum of the top portion. And then you can figure out, you know, at least calculate portions of that whole stack, or at least, you know, test it. Um, I think we'll have prob you know, questions, time for questions at the end. I usually like people to interrupt me throughout, but um, if you do have a question imminently, feel free to say it, and I'll repeat it, repeat the question for those streaming. Um, yeah, so briefly, and this goes way off the screen because SHA-256 is big. When you fetch something from a registry, the first thing that you're doing here, I, I was playing with a Debian testing image. Some of the HTTP APIs that are hit is that it will check to see, like dereference that first tag. So I said Nginx stable. Here it would be Debian colon testing. It first hits that, and it gets back a checksum that is going to be the next object it steps to in this tree here. So then it gets back an object that is the manifest. And of that manifest, um, it kind of skips over the image index in this particular example. But it'll get the manifest. Now it will go fetch that checksum of that manifest. The thing it gets back is some JSON object. That JSON object will then tell it where the config and other layers are, and it can fetch those, those as well. And then it can checksum the whole thing and say, I've got this checksum, I've got these objects, this is exactly what I was expecting to receive, we're good to go, and then it unpacks it and figures it out. So all this is happening every time you say docker run or container D, nerd cuddle, podman, whatever. But deployments now are much more than just containers. Um, You're seeing a lot of this evolution. You're, see, you're hearing, you know, NIST and NIST and government policies talking about attestation and you know all this kind of stuff. So many more of these are going to uh, or tease out and continue to become important. For most people, it's Helm charts, and so they they hear about Helm charts and they say it's not just a single container. It might not be directly this YAML, but I need to figure out like what this service actually looks like when it's deployed out. Um, it's a constant evolution. Uh, all of these it still is at the crux of it is using containers uh, in the cloud native world. So what kind of needs do you have in that space? Um, it gets into like kind of storing the state and related configs. Uh, how do you start having different metadata that's attached to this? Sometimes you'll have outside services that will just store the containers, digest, and you know, correlate that data. Sometimes people will put, uh, there's data structures for like labels and annotations, but you, there's stop, you're seeing lots of like linking here. Um, and so at some point when you're creating new metadata, how do you not reinvent the wheel? Um, and we're having some of these 
interesting conversations with whole other ecosystems that are now in the cloud native space, but effectively are trying to reinvent containers for their space. Uh, hmm. So, how do we do this? All my stuff is whacked out. So it's to put it to put it simply, it's it's one does not simply just do this. Like eventually, if you did create a new place to store objects and you have a new deployment fashion, I get it. The APIs that we have they evolved quickly uh, and then they've kind of slowed down and now they're heavily watched. <laughs> I'll, I'll be perfectly honest, they're not great all the time, but they work and now people have processes and they've started to harden them and they've kicked the tires of it. And there's lots of situations when we get down to some of these conversations about image format or the APIs. We all wish it could be more ideal, but it's also pretty ironed out and to change it would be to start over and do that whole lift again, uh, which is completely possible and some people might wanna do that. Just know that you're, you know, a little bit of a Sisyphus task. That we've already done that. How can we reuse what we're doing a lot? Um, so even here recently, uh, there's been a discussion around a new media type that would make things a little bit more generic and not sound like a container image when it's actually a signature. You know, I want to push a signature at a registry and reuse all those mechanisms. How how can I have something that's more generic? And so we've had a lot of those conversations. Um, and it might still happen, it's just we recognize it would be a long, you know, on-ramp to bring in new media types. So currently, even particularly the solution is how do we bolt this onto the existing container image format uh, and continue basically the, the onboarding we already started even six years ago to enable new use cases. So um, with that, the ground's kind of set. You see how some stuff moves slowly and how there's this component that's basically slow moving and boring at the center of cloud native. Most people use it and it's just completely implied what it does. So how do we start extending that and saying, okay, cool, if that's a given, either I know I'm going to start at the bottom of the hill and create something new, or I'm gonna just figure out how to hack on this thing that's already available. Some of the various tools that I'm gonna show next, and um, I do wanna emphasize, you know, my slides are already online and you can go use them. Um, I intentionally did not paste these examples but made screenshots, so you have to type it in yourself. Um, is, this is maybe interesting and it's a learning ex exercise for you so that you can put your hands on some of this, but most of everything that I'm about to show you is should be in transparent to you as a user. You're just going to be using various tools and components and workflows and probably even things from companies that are, will, will make increasingly value add services or make thing, workflows more easy. You just should be aware of what's happening behind the scenes. Um, so very, very simply, uh, I, I even worked on a project while I was at Red Hat where we were wanting to make the, the source of a lot of the RPMs that we were publishing in container images available in a like manner uh, for certain licenses uh, to make the source of those source RPMs available in the same way that you would fetch and use it. So if you're fetching a container image, how would you fetch the source RPMs for all those without having to hit different APIs, effectively use the same APIs? Um, some licenses are a little bit more particular to this, like if I'm remembering correctly, it was like the LGPL 3.1 like manner. So this is basically how the state of the art has been and probably will continue to be for some folks because it checks a box, they're, they're fine with it. But from scratch, over there you'll see, doo -doo -doo. I can't get my pointer. But you see from scratch and you have some local file like hi.txt and you just add that thing to a register, you know, to a, the file system and you push it. It's only, you know, the whole thing is only pretty tiny. Well, that's not the whole thing, but still. And then you can push it somewhere. Um, now, this thing's not gonna run. It's, it's, this is not an executable at all. 
you would have to have tools to fetch it and unpack it, see the you know content. There's more metadata you want to have around it, but at the crux of it, this is the state of the art for packaging non-container content. Um, what you don't see, but is kind of implied in that high dot text, is the file system. There's still something to unpack. So this is still a file sitting inside of a tar archive that's gzipped. That's the whole object. So next, what if we Oh, this is just stepping through it. Sorry. So here, here's the first use of one of these tools. So here now I've pushed this container image at the, uh, the registry, and I'm using crane as a, a tool that I, I go to pretty often. Manifest is the command. It's actually reaching out to that remote registry, and the image that I just push, pushed, I get back the JSON object of that manifest, and I'm going to see what is the media type of the thing that holds high.txt. So here you'll see that exact thing I just said. It's, it's actually a tar archive that is that object. Um, so if you fetched it, you'd still have to unpack it. So then just to show some variety, I'll use this other tool, uh, ORAS, uh, or ORAS, or whatever, however you want to pronounce it. It's always funny saying things out loud when you only ever read them. Um, it's OCI registry as storage, O-R-A-S. So here I'm using ORAS to push the same file now. Uh, I gave it a different image name, but the big part that I'll show is different is that I'm pushing that file high.txt, and then their markup for this particular command is that colon, now I can give it an arbitrary MIME type or media type for that file. So if it was JSON or you know plain text, application, you know, plain text, I could tell it exactly what the media type is of that file and push it to the registry. And then here's basically the same command to see what the media type is of that layer. And no longer is that thing a tar archive. It is the raw text file itself. And I gave it my own vendor, you know, made up vendor identity, but if you fetched it, there's not even anything to unpack. It's just straight the text file. Where this is interesting and now is if you imagined, like that example of pushing source RPMs, you might have a layer, like many, many, many layers that are all just the source RPMs themselves, not a file sitting in a tar archive that has to be unpacked over and over and over, redundant steps. And you start seeing a lot more um, reuse of space so now when you see that checksum or that digest of that particular object, you can see the checksum of that same object locally or in a yum repo or otherwise without having to say, oh, it is gzipped and it's in a tar archive. So you know, now your, your content addressable storage doesn't line up. Now you start to see how it lines up a lot more. Um, this example is the same as, well, almost the same as what I just showed you now, but without the JQ command to parse to that media type. When I did the ORAS push, this is the actual media type that got pushed there. Um, so as I was saying, the bolting on or like just making it work, I've just pushed a thing to a container registry that is a single text file and there was this other boilerplate config that still had to be there because it, it knows how to interact in all the tools. Or if you wanted to have portability between different cloud registries or local registries, certain things have to be in place. Um, so you'll see in that config object, and it has the media type and digest, that config is null and void. There's no actual config there. There's no environment variables. There's nothing to run. It's actually just curly brackets. It's only two bytes large. So some of the tools that are now starting to work with these kind of the features know or are becoming a, smarter and aware of like when you get something that has different media types or you know possibly has different annotations that don't actually try and run it. Um, 
it's just going to be the, sim the you know the, the file that you're looking at and maybe some other an annotations around that so I'm, this is again should be transparent in the future but it's good and nice to know about um, so next similar example in this here I have that Debian testing image uh, local on my computer I use crane I push that out to the registry so that you can see the whole checksum of it the important part of this first command is once it pushes what I said as this Debian testing you know name and tag it comes back and says, well, here's actually the checksum that it is, you know, B75, BC75 something. Um, I'm going to go and actually edit this thing that I just pushed. So I pushed a text file. Um, I pushed this text file to the registry. But somehow I want to say, maybe this text file that I pushed is somehow, you know, I, I, need, I want to add some metadata to it and somehow relate it to that Debian testing. This is a contrived example. I'll, I'll circle it back. If you're confused, I understand. Uh, I've been there too. But I'm going to go back and add this block of JSON to the text file and make it actually relate to this Debian image. Hmm, I could have laid this out better. So crane edit manifest is another neat command. It actually will fetch the content from the registry, open it in your local editor, allow you to, you know, VI or whatever it is. So I'm going to actually add the, the JSON to this object it then repushes and, and gives you the new checksum because it's fundamentally with the Merkle tree, it's fundamentally a new checksum. So now high text, um, here's your new digest, the tag is updated and it added the, the JSON that I, I was interested in. Um, but regardless, the, these are some of the tools that you can use to like put your hand on it. So now seeing a few different examples of like, here's Merkle trees in action, here's editing the JSON, like here's object content addressability. Why, why would you ever want to play with this? Or you know, what, how, how does all this relate together? So just like I said earlier, you do have deployment configs, you have Helm charts. At this point, Helm charts actually have a deployment tactic where they can push to OCI registries. Um, most of the time, those are somewhat independent of the images that they might even reference. Um, it might be that they are just using tags and they're not, they're not pointing to specific instances. There might be situations where you have Helm charts that are very explicit and say, actually, this exact digest of an image, and at some point, they would need to be linked to those images. So you could kind of see that cross-reference. More, more explicitly, signatures. How many people would like to know that the person that built the Im the the person they expected to have built that image was actually the person that it, that built that image. Hopefully, everybody in the room. Um, most of the time, people are just a, a, expecting that they have an implied trust on, like HTTPS trust, that they fetched it and that nobody man in the middle them. You couldn't actually prove that MariaDB maintainers actually built MariaDB. You need signatures for that. So now you've got this new object that is deeply related to the exact build of the image, where are you going to store that signature? You can store it in the registry and link it. Um, uh, software bill and materials also might relate deeply to the exact image. Push that to the registry. Um, we're going to continue to see new different types of packages, jars, RPMs, WASM, uh, BPF, all kinds of stuff. Um, those objects really don't always need to be stored in a tar archive. They might just be referenced directly, and you'll see the media type be you know, some kind of BPF bytecode or WASM or otherwise. Um, and I'm certainly missing a lot 
more. Uh, there's just a few projects that have bubbled up to the top recently and uh, will be in that situation. So all this comes to another feature that has been working in the OCI recently called the Refers API. Um, we already have a release candidate for a, a, the, an iteration on the distribution spec um, that specifically now allows that text that I've ad added to my um, high.txt image earlier is kind of the keyword there. So refers list in the API, um, you can actually have images, uh, manifests that actually point to other manifests. So you can explicitly link these things rather than contorting a workflow and have the thing that they're referencing be different types of media types. Um, so uh, some, some of the registries actually, specifically here, I just want to show that um, even when you're pushing some content, you might actually see that it's adding, you know, it sees that there's a new subject and it adds that link as a new refer type. So you see how they're connected. Um, yeah. So why, why do all this? Why see some of the building blocks of how this is kind of boring, this is intentionally slow moving, um, why not just build a whole new service or, you know, like iterate more fastly, more, more quickly at this point? The big effort is to try and keep this simple. Like what are the most common building blocks between a lot of these different challenges? So when we hear different communities get involved um, and they rightfully have additional services or additional, additional like semantics that they need for their, their language or their project, what are the common problems that we're all trying to solve here? Um, and that keeping it simple is tough and it, and it requires a lot of conversation, a lot of deliberation and a lot of debate. Um, but how can, we base, how can we use this content addressable store, um, make it extendable and um, build on what we already have that's at the crux of most cloud native deployments? Um, yeah, that's, that's basically that. The, probably the mo most useful slide in this whole deck is right here. And again, you can find, find this slide, uh, find this online because this is too small to take a picture of. Um, but from the top, it's the, the Auras project, the Crane utility, um, additional projects in the space like Reg Client and Scopio have different aspects of interacting and manipulating or just interacting with. Uh, the two different signing projects that are going on information around how Helm charts interact with OCI, information around uh, Fermion Spin and how it, it works with WASM and there's other tools in that space as well. Uh, Bumblebee is a project that's actually storing uh, BPF code in registries so you can actually pull it down and interact with deploying BPF applications as if it was a container. Um, blogs around how you can use this upcoming feature functionality on like Azure Container Registry at least. Um, a really good dive into this references, like what all this references means by ChainGuard. Um, Explore.ggcr.dev. John Johnson is one of the lead people behind Crane, but ended up putting a really simple and really, really useful website together that you can just paste and get like click through and most things are hyperlinked so you can even click into images and see what's actually inside images and like figure out what's going on. A um, Couple more, but even most recently, if you ever found yourself running like Docker run registry, just to have something to play with, um, is the pull request even for references support into that Docker distribution or distribution distribution registry. Uh, and with that, I'm done. We have a few minutes for questions, uh, and I'll be around this week. Uh, in this room right now, if you are working or interested in this space, do reach out. Um, just like I was saying with the kind of the onboarding interest, you know, as an open source or user, consumer, person that learned in this space, it was only through people that 
I was almost afraid to talk to when I first got started and that I'm like permanently indebted to. So please reach out to anybody that's involved. There's several folks in the room that I keep looking at that are maintainers of some of these projects. They're involved in the standards and specifications. They're worried about backwards compatibility and they're out there fighting the fight for people who will never know their name. Um, and so if you have use cases that you know, you're just interested in or that you're worried about breaking, you know, that would be broken by this kind of features, um, we wanna hear about that. So specifically find us, seek us out, because um, we wanna hear. And otherwise I'm VBATS online and uh, feel free to find me. Any questions? Going once, going twice. Cool. All right. Thank you all.